Hi, I'm uh, Brother James. Um, first message I've got to say to you today is that Jesus like an entering in the kingdom of heaven by having childlike faith. In essence, or even a little child can understand. So if a little child can understand, then I'm hoping a so-called theologian can understand as well. And if I give everybody this picture, imagine you own a car, you have a car, and that car has the words eternal life wrote on it. Okay, now then, the difference between um, <clears throat> somebody who believes they have to work for their salvation, as opposed to somebody like myself and genuine saved people, would be that Jesus gives us this car, which is called eternal life. And we simply accept that. We take the keys and we drive it away. And that's it. Whether we drive that car into the ground or keep it absolutely mint spotless, perfect for the rest of our days, that's our car. We can't ever lose it. Jesus has promised it. Um, we, can, we can never lose it because unless, uh, unless the word eternal has been redefined that I'm not aware of, that's ours to keep forever. Now then, the so-called works-based crowd, or sometimes known as sinless perfection or lordship or whatever, come in a variety of um, sneaky ways, uh, generally with great swelling words, um, particularly Calvinists. Um, but the essence is, is works. I mean, you do have outright works, and to help people with this would be people like the Jehovah's False Witnesses or the Morons, sorry, I mean Mormons, um, many, many people who directly have works or the Catholic Church. Uh, and like I said, just getting to it, the other side of what I would call direct works, they have flavours of this, but the main variety of direct would be the equivalent of Jesus saying, right, I want to give you this vehicle called eternal life. However, you need to maintain the right speed limit on the road. You may need to maintain uh, the, every stop sign. You need to stop. You need to fill out your MOT certificate. And for anybody who's in America, that's like our driver's record kind of thing. Um, you need to do all these things. Now, what happens if we forget to do our paperwork one day? What happens if we forget to fill up the tank in the car or any of these things? Does Jesus suddenly turn up the pain and go, hey, sorry, do you know you haven't worked hard enough? You haven't, you, haven't, you haven't cleaned the car hard enough or whatever? I mean, if you think about what I'm saying there, Jesus actually said clean the inside of the cup first rather than the outside. And what he was meaning by that was you need to be saved first before you can start working on anything else. And particularly in my background of growing up in the what I would term the charismaniac church, of, or also known as the charismatic church is it's purely 99% theater, very light 15, 20 minute sermonettes, pure emotionalism, um, you know, the don't judge crowd. You know, I like to say to them, people like that now, did you make a judgment on whether you had toast or cereal this morning? You know, so non-committal um, people who don't even know that they're even writing the right Bible, now, I'm not saying every single person there for a second is a bad person somewhat um, within reason or, uh, or they're unsaved because I believe a lot of people go to these places. Um, but in certainly in terms of a eschatological timeline where we are now, obviously the Bible clearly says that times are going to get darker rather than lighter. And the word, um, you know, may eventually become uh, illegal one day. Um, in, in all of its varieties of that. Um, so the emphasis is, like with the worldwide communist takeover that we're currently seeing at the moment, um, is dumbed down it's so much that uh, you get a medal for the colour of your skin. You get a medal for coming in last place. And this is just simply not God's way. Um, so as we see that uh, replicated with false Bible versions, particularly the, the biggest selling book in the world, which is uh, the NIV, or what we would save people would call the non-inspired version. Um, most people don't know that is from uh, documents such as the Sinaiticus B and so on and so on, um, the Codex Vaticanus and so on and so on. 
basically Catholic documents that were found in a bin. Um, and so they're not getting the meat of the word. Now, I'm not saying for a second um, a, a, a pastor or somebody who's learning, who, who isn't sure of this and, and, and you know, as long as they give the, the right plan of salvation, um, a.k.a. the free gift or the free vehicle uh, with no strings attached, you know, Jesus said he was made a free will offering for us all. Um, you know, it's as simple as that. You look at the world and basically all the way through the Bible, we have the world separating itself from God. Now, this is this is expressly told um, in the beginning in the Tower of Babel. Um, because, you know, a lot of unlearned people think, well, that's just a nice story, but they have no understanding what that is. That's the first, I mean, there are instances before this, but I would say that's the first large scale story. Yes, we could go to Cain and Abel, but I would say that um, this is quite literally where we are now in terms of Bible prophecy, the perfect replication or semaculum, uh, et cetera, of um, how man is trying to work his way to heaven by building his own tower and his own way. Now, uh, Proverbs uh, from memory um, says, I think it's 1625 says, uh, for there is a way that seems right to a man in his own eyes, but the end thereof is death. Uh, and basically along the lines with scriptures like, for they form the God in their own image. Now, when these people go to these church and it's all singing, all dancing and everything, they don't know for sure that they have eternal life. Whereas Jesus quite clearly said in, in my favorite scripture in um, John 5, 24, very, very, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath present presence, hath everlasting life and shall not come unto condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Now, that quite clearly says they're instant, saved and sealed under the day of redemption. But yet you'll hear these bozos and clowns, people like, oh, where am I thinking um, currently in the world where I'm located in England at the moment, because uh, I travel around, obviously. You, I've confronted people like this, and there is video out there just as evidence, um, where you'll say to them, hey, your teaching works. And they will say, Oh, well, I believe it's faith alone, but well, what do you mean by but? Please expound on that for me. Uh, well, some people will say, well you, we, well, you need to maintain your car, eternal life car, plus you need to be water baptized. Well, when Jesus gave me this free eternal life vehicle, there was no terms and conditions in the small print that I had to read. I just simply believed it by childlike faith as what the Bible says. Um, you know, and, and God, the key bit here is that um, when one of the disciples said, Lord, are there few that be saved? We can come back to another verse in Matthew 7, 21, which is one of the most quoted verses I have when I deal with quote unquote Christians who uh, are teaching what we would call Lordship salvation, um, which is the, the other blend or one of the many blends of works. And this is even more sneaky to the point of view where they say, hey, we believe it's by faith alone. There's no works required. However, if you truly are saved, just like the devil in the beginning, did God really say, if you truly are saved, then you will keep your car perfectly spotless and clean. And there won't be no defects in it. So, okay. So let's just say that we have a drunk driver. Or, or somebody who can't stop drinking and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet the next day um, they fully understood the gospel, should I say, the present day, they fully understood the gospel, they got saved, um, they said in the heart, you know, confession is made unto salvation. That doesn't necessarily mean oratory because man first believed in the heart unto righteousness because um, there are a blend of people who, out there who teach that uh, you need a verbal confession, which is ridiculous. Um, now, getting back to the point, let's just say that drunk the next day, he, 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 he after he's, uh, you know, he's, he's been saved, he, for whatever reason, uh, like the Bible says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
The next day, he starts drinking again, and he crashes his lovely eternal life car, writes it off in a booze state. Now, he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and God said, no man can take them away or pluck them out of my hand. You know, um, you are sealed and saved under the day of redemption. So the second he believed, he was sealed and saved. Now, most Christians think unless you live a perfect life or you keep up with works, that man, uh, God's lying. Well, the Bible says, who is the Antichrist? But makes God a liar. So all these people are simply fall in two categories. And chief notably in this day and age, we have somebody called Ray Comfort or Ray Discomfort, as I call him. Um, because... He'll, like a true politician, out of one side of his mouth say, hey, when, when are you going to turn from your sins? Sorry about the accent. I'm really bad at them. And he'll also say, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but you also need to turn from your sins. Now, if I just get my Bible up in here, just so I'm not making this, and I'll, I'll read this verbatim. And this is what it says, and anybody watching this can, can read along on their King James-only Bible, because if you don't have a King James, every other, sorry to break it to you, but you don't have a correct Bible. Um, we can get to that in another episode. But to him that worketh not, did everybody catch that? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith, get that word, his faith is counted unto righteousness. So I have faith in Jesus when I accepted that free gift. Clearly, all these other people either don't have faith or they're lying. So um, the Bible says that, the you know, um, false prophets teach for filthy lucre's sake, which to anybody who doesn't know what that means, that means for money. Now, um, or, or for some form of power or fame or whatever. Now, the Bible says, what profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Um, now then, I can honestly say here, um, I'm a sinner, just like everybody else. Thank God the Lord Jesus Christ saved me, and I, I believed in that free gift. I took that free gift, but I still sin every day, and that's called daily sanctification. I don't need to improve my behavior every day to work my way to heaven. I'm sealed and saved. Now, there's another scripture then uh, in Galatians 2.16 which says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. I don't need to read the rest of the verse. Let me just read that first bit again. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So if any moron, idiot, or the unlearned people, or people who have just come to Christianity, which, again, there's some little portion of forgiveness in there in the sense that they're learning or they've been taught by a false preacher. Um, we as humans um, can have that little bit of grace more. However, if you stick to that, God says all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament, I am not a respecter of persons. He's not going to respect that. And you will immediately fall back in that category of Matthew seven twenty one. Uh, because I didn't believe I didn't touch on the full context of that in the sense of that is wrote of when somebody dies and meets God. And it's in the context of all these false converts. And I want to read that out now. It says, so imagine somebody's crashed the car and died. And they're the camp who believe in works, salvation or some form of works because they've been maintained that car. And this is what God says to them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord. So they're calling him Lord, right? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow, that's a shocker for a lot of people who are going to be hearing this for the first time. But he that doth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Well, what's the will? Well, that's believing on Christ, quite simply, with childlike faith. Many will say to him that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name? And in thy name cast out many devils. You, you think of the charismaniac church and all of these places. All the people are going to say, well, I ran a soup kitchen, Lord. Yes, but did you have childlike faith? You see? Um, and then I will profess unto them, here's the key bit. Then, and then I will press, profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Get that word there, ye that work iniquity. You're working iniquity. 
you know um and this is often the um <clears throat> this is often coming from a lot of people who say um the works the workspace people who will say you if everybody's ever heard this term which i'm sure you will have i'm probably even pretty much sure that most of your pastors will be hearing this will say this term you need to repent of your sins to be saved well firstly i've yet to see one of anywhere in the king james bible which i know pretty well where it says i need to do any of that to be saved because i'm believing by childlike faith and i put this to anybody who who wants to go and look at their bible now you know, the, the word repent is mentioned over 130 times. And quite simply in the Greek, uh, metanoia just simply means to, to change your mind or turn from one thing to another. Uh, repente in Spanish just means I was going in this direction and then I turned that way. I didn't magically became sinless along the way. <laughs> and and just so to, to, to qualify this point, uh, which I say to a lot of these works salvation crowd, could you tell me who the first person if repent means to repent from sins, and we would both agree that obviously God's sinless, which is probably the only thing we're going to agree on. Could you tell me who the first person, along with the person who repented most as an individual in the Bible is? Could you tell me who that is? Now, I've never had an answer to this yet. Most people will just walk away at this point. So thankfully, people who are listening to this today are going to now know that the first person in Genesis 6, 6 to go and check this out, the first person to repent was the Lord himself. Now, if you're calling God a sinner, wow, you are pretty much done at that point. But God, you know what? God loves you so much if you believe in faith alone before you die in this mortal earth and you, you actually repent of your repenting this. Um, he, he will save you. But thankfully, I would presume that a lot of people who are listening today um, are faith alone. Now, I'm speaking probably to a lot of the Reformed crowd today and, um, you know, a lot of Lutherans and Calvinists and so on and so on. Um, and there's one thing you have over the Charismaniacs. You have read your Bible. However, if it's not King James, you need to put that thing in the trash. Because that's the same as the eternal life vehicle. And the same as the separation, the, the Bible is a constant pattern over and over again. It's either pure, undefiled word of God or it's not. So, for example, um, if you say take the N NKJV, the New King James Bible, should I say, a lot of us listening here today will know who, the, who, who Jehovah is, right? Well, if somebody reads that Bible for the first time, they're not going to know who Jehovah is. Do you know why? Because they completely extract that. Now, bearing in mind in the King James Bible, the last thing God said to us was don't even think about changing one jar tittle in here or every plague in this book shall be added unto you. You know, and so people who've wrote their own Bible, such as Joseph Smith, you know, uh, whether it's Islam, um, whether it's Charles Taze Russell of the Jehovah's False Witnesses, they're done at this point. It, God says that um, there's somewhere called outer darkness for the false prophet. I believe it's in Matthew 22, 13. Um, and basically, um, that, that is telling you that there's not just hell for unbelievers, but this is why it's so serious about this works thing versus the grace thing. Because I believe Jesus when he said it was a free will offering, you know, um, and if you think about this, people go soul winning because most people will not go soul winning. Now, I've been soul winning all around the world. And I say that to other ex to, and any other experienced soul winner will tell you the same thing. Most people tend to think they're a pretty good person. So they're going to take the world's way, whether they I quote unquote identify as a Christian or not. They're going to say, well, I'm a pretty good person or whatever it is. And the Bible clearly says in Romans 3.23, which is the first part of the gospel, for all have sinned and all come short the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, there's no just man upon the earth that does good and sinneth not. Okay. So nobody's good. And for any Jews who may be listening, the Bible says you had an advantage and that was at the time. But there's no difference between, as the Bible says now in the New Testament, well, it was always by faith alone. But just to emphasize the point, there's neither a difference between 
the Jew, Greek, Gentile. In other words, God's covering everybody. Um, however, we have we have uh, the workspace salvation itself there, uh, not just the street screeches as I call them, but we have a particular lot called the Hebrew Roots, um, who believe they're a, a, from a certain tribe. Now, I have some very good black friends who will back up everything I will say here. Um, because a lot of these people tend to be black and tend to be saying, well, this is because of our tribe, which perfectly comes into the ridiculousness, reverse engineered racism, if you believe in that word, of course. Because um, the last time I checked from the whole of the Bible, one percent of people's not like to know that, but we've put a modern word on that spin. Um, but yeah, a lot of these people say, well, we want to cling to the Old Testament law, the law of Moses. Well, that was for a statute. To that generation and that was for a statute and jesus said all things have been done away with me in christ that's why christ was crucified he says we have a new and better way we have a new and better testament so why in the world would people want to be under bondage what jesus himself said i set you free from because the bible says the law worketh wrath so if you try and keep the whole law, as the Apostle Paul said, if you offend in one, just one point of the law, then you might as well have broken all of the law. And then, unbelievably, you will get people out there who say, well, I've never broken the law. I have turned from all my sins. And I'll say, well, okay, do you know the Bible says that you have secret sins? Could you tell, and I need an answer to this because nobody's ever been able to answer this one. Could you tell me how you've turned from or repented from all of your secret sins? So these people really ultimately fall down to it's a, a, a God they have formed in their own image. You know, as it says, it says, you know, uh, the end thereof is death because they've 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 made their own God up. And, and here's a scripture I quote a lot of the time as well. Um, and I'll read it out for you now. It says in Ephesians 2, 2, 8, 2, Ephesians 2, 8 to 9, sorry. For by grace are you saved through faith. And here's the key bit, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So let's think about what I've said today and quarterback this and truncate this. You think about that free gift, that free vehicle called eternal life what Jesus has given you. And then you look at this scripture here and you think about what the other, the other side of the, the coin is, what those, those wicked people are trying to say. And then we'll compare scripture here. For by grace... Are you saved through faith? So that's free there. <clears throat> and not of yourselves. So I'm not maintaining my salvation. I'm not maintaining I have to check in with the government. I'm not maintaining I have to check in with the new world order. Okay. It is the gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should boast. It is, did you hear that? It is the gift of God. Here's your free car. Do what you want with it. Now, the Bible does say, and here's a key bit, which a lot of these people do either don't understand or for the very few who may be saved and they're just regurgitating teaching stuff that they, that they don't know about, is that the Bible says those who are his, he who he loves, he chasteneth and scourgeth them. This is why you need the King James Bible to get correct doctrine. Now, so that's saying that God's already instituted laws that, you know, that if I say go out and murder somebody, I'll get put to prison. Now, however, a little caveat to that would be in the end times and we don't have legit government now. We have corporate enterprises that rule the world. Um, God's still essentially, that's null and void in my opinion at this point. However, God's still going to... Um, God's not to be mocked. He knows if I go out and murder somebody, I'm not going to be go unpunished as a believer right so and and god's 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 a, a right and fair judge he knows if somebody tried to break in my house and i killed them say because i was defending my house that's a legitimate lawful thing you know i'm sure these liberal communists um as it's the bible says are looking to change laws um which uh, the, the scripture off the top of my head i've um i forgot um i think it's yeah. It's, it, there's an application there's there's other there's in there but there's an application you can take from daniel 725 um 
and this is speaking in, in the, the application I'm going to use here is in the is in the um, the Antichrist spirit, shall we say, which says, um, and he shall speak great words against the Most High. You know, uh, talking about the end times as well, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And here's the key bit: and think to change times and laws. Now there are some people out there who think this is meaning like astrophysics and. <laughs> the devil can somehow change metals and things. No, what he's talking about there is like um, where God says, like, yes, the Levitical law doesn't stand today, but as a schoolmaster, it does. So, for example, if we take murder, we shouldn't murder somebody. Now, as certain states and those wicked people like Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau and a lot of these people in the world at the moment, they're looking to change laws and let the criminals off that we're seeing okay and this is one of the many um one of the many pretexts sorry one of the many foreshadowings that we're going to see where the bible literally talks about iniquity and talks about uh lawlessness in the end times so yeah um i know i'm tying the uh, uh, the end times in a lot uh what i just have to touch on that a lot because I think a lot of people are not aware where we are. And the gospel is quite simply this. And I would say this as if I was knocking on the door. Imagine I'm knocking on your virtual door today. You know, the Bible says that all have sinned. In Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned and all have come short the glory of God. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Now, like the Bible says, if you offend one time, you're broken the whole law. So you are a debtor to the law. Now, thank God, Jesus paid that price. He was the appropriation made for us. Okay. Jesus died and paid the cross. Jesus died on the cross and paid our sins for us. Now, in order for us to get that free vehicle of eternal life, all we simply need to do, just like the thief on the cross, and I use this analogy all the time, the world rejected him. But the thief on the cross said to him, good master, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And he simply believed him. Okay. What the work salvation crowd want to do is go, hang on, Jesus. And I'm putting myself in the place. They're putting themselves in the place of the thief on the cross. Hang on, Jesus. I'm going to believe you, but let me just go home. Write everybody a sorry letter. Open lots of doors for all ladies. Delete all my porn and my search history, pour all my alcohol and drugs down the sink, go and high five everybody that I know, tell them I'm sorry, then get back up on the cross and go, right, me and you, we're ready now. Like, no, it's either by Jesus alone in him, because he's the only person that has power to forgive sins, not you, not yourself, Ray Discomfort, okay, it's by Jesus, by faith alone. Um, there's, there's, there's a couple of other scriptures I, I, I like to say um, and this is particularly one we see with the, the modern day church uh, not just applying the Ray discomfort and Sonny Shocker from Manchester and many others um, Todd Frail, uh, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Sin sorry Benny Hinn uh, many many more um, this is 2 Corinthians 11 uh, for I think it is. Uh, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, let me read that bit again. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, and in there you can just insert Jehovah's Witness, all the ones we would think to know, but you would also insert Martin Luther, John Calvin, which by the way, if there's any Calvinists listening, uh, I, can't, I can't remember if it's Michael Savidas or Stephen Savidas, I'd need to research that, but he was one of, I believe, many men he had put to death uh, because he couldn't handle the truth. Anyway, um, yeah, let's get back to that scripture. Um, yeah, so this is 2 Corinthians, I think it's 11.3, but we'll double check that and we'll put it on here. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, and he's the key bit, or another gospel which you have not stood, you might bear well with him. So let's go back to the start of that verse. Another Jesus. Well, quite literally, we see that evidentiary uh, purposes. We can gain through experiential knowledge in the form of 
let's say you stop a Mormon in the street and notice how when they see you as a safe Christian, they gently put their hand over the front cover of their book, which quite literally says another gospel. <laughs> That's what that scripture just said. You know, the Mormons believe in multiple gods, whereas the book of Isaiah says there were no gods formed before me and there shall be none formed after me. So who are these gods or this angel Moroni? You know, um, Jesus said for many pro false prophets have gone into the world. OK, um, now I'm just honing in on a lot of um, people who go to Episcopalian church. Um, and uh, or Church of England, depending on which side of the water you're on. Now, I don't think every single person is unsaved who goes there. However, because they're being generally taught by unsaved people, they're not going to gain no meat. Yeah, they might learn a couple of things in terms of uh, hist historical things or whatever. I'm not saying that. But in terms of deep scripture, they're not going to get that. And if they do, it's going to be wrong or it's just going to be nonsense. Uh, particularly like Calvinists who read endless hours of commentary about the Bible but haven't simply got a clue how to be saved. Because the last time I checked, L standing for limited atonement, the last time I checked, we have free will. God gave us free will. Okay. Um, we have the predestinationalists who believe God's already picked his favourites and Calvinism bites into this to say, well, God's already selected some like plays favourites. Not that, as the Bible says, he tasted death for all mankind the last time I checked. Um, so, yeah, so many, many topics to cover, but just to circle the point and bring it back together, that if you ever hear this term, repent your sins, you can take it to the bank that that teacher's either unsaved on his way to hell or at the very least, he is just misguided and God hasn't given up on him yet because there is a reprobate doctrine out there. Now, this is falsely deemed as a, maybe an Andersonite view, although I believe Pastor Anderson is saved and uh, teaches some very good doctrine. Um, however, he's quite simply wrong about that because the last time I checked, Mark 3 says all sin. <laughs> um, but um, there is a reprobate doctrine out there for sure. And the reprobate doctrine is this, and it's speaking on the spiritual application of uh, those who um, quite simply, like like all the way through the Bible, have either um, gone the wrong way by simply not believing on the Lord or uh, a reprobate mind of choosing the world or quite simply of uh, forming a, a God in their own image or a perverted, perverted God, like a false God. Uh, like Allah or whatever it is. Um, so quite simply, that's that's the case there. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I will say this to people as well, which you never hear out of these grievous wolves. Um, everything I've said today, I want people to check and fact check, not like the fake fact checkers and the fake disinformation that's going on in the world, this new world order takeover. I want you to check everything from the King James Bible, what I've said. And as a matter of course, if you're not using the King James Bible, whichever version you have, I would like you to compare both versions because you're going to have a lot of scripture missing or changed. Okay. Well, it goes back to a little bit what I, I'll start out with. It, it goes back to a little bit of what I said before, which is a lot of these people are not reading the King James Bible anyway, uh, because there's some key words in there that those who he loves, he chasteneth and scourgeth. So, for example, if we start with the most important thing of all, the Great Commission. Now, Jesus talks about, you know, the field is, is, is plentiful. Uh, the labourers are few, uh, don't be just a hearer, but rather a doer. And if we looked where we are in the world right now, there are very few, and I suspect always have been, very few soul winners. You know, the, the Great Commission is, for anybody who may not know this, what Jesus said, um, go out into the highways and the byways two by two and compel them to come in. Now, that would take on the modern form of um, soul winning, as we would call it, or evangelism, door-to-door -door evangelism. Um, 
you know, um, he certainly didn't say anything about street preaching. Uh, lift up your voice, cry aloud and spare not. The last time I checked, it doesn't show that anybody got saved in Isaiah as a side note. So again, leaning into the street preacher thing. But in answer to this question about um, living and dying by the, the law, obviously the Apostle Paul's made it very clear that like, be all things to all men. Um, and that, you know, um, let's say if you're a, a church that, particularly as an emphasis on feeding the crowd. We'll use, we'll use homelessness or hunger, which is pretty relevant at the moment. Um, those are great things. Those are, those are great things. Now, in God's providence, um, God is not going to condemn you if you choose to, let's say, you're an active member of the church and you haven't gone and because you wanted to stay home and play PlayStation or whatever it is. Um, God's not going to condemn you for not going, say, in that example. But you know what? What he is going to do is he's not going to give you the reward where, let's say, hypothetically, you may have gone to the soup kitchen and there was an unsaved person in the crowd wanting a bowl of soup or whatever it is, and you've got to do some discipleship or fellowship with that person and sit down with them, you've missed out on that reward by not being able to speak to them. So um, to break that down even further, um, to live by every jot and tittle, that is just simply not possible and that's not in the great. That, that's why the Apostle Paul, who called himself the chief of sinners, I mean, this is the main apostle, called himself the chief of sinners, said he was a slave to sin, who wrote two thirds of the New Testament under the inspiration of scripture, under the inspiration of God, sorry. Like, so if that man tells me he's the chief of sinner, you wicked fool in 2023 who are telling me that you can keep the whole law, you know, like, this is ridiculous. People need to grow up. You know, as the Bible says, don't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine like little children. You need to read what the Bible says and get on to some sound teaching. The Bible says no man may teach you. Now, the reason why I said that is because where we are today, there are very few churches in the whole world. And let me dispel one myth right now. There's no such thing as the perfect church. Now, the fundamentals any saved Christian will have right. However, we get things wrong. And I'll start with myself. And what I will say is I'll give you a little bit of testimony here. I was brought up in the charismaniac church, the, or what some people call the name it and claim it crowd. And then I also grew up in the black church as well and uh, met many wonderful people. Um, but unfortunately, most of those people are believing in a form of direct works or more generally, or mainly, should I say, um, lordship salvation as it's termed. And there'll be links in this description below uh, to show you what that is uh, and the heresy of that. Um, you know, um, and what I see is that like, like again, just to finish it off with this scripture, like what Paul said, if you offend in one point of the law, you failed. Because in essence, like this, what we talked about when you meet God on your deathbed, you will have to say to him, Jesus has done the works for me, we just have to receive this. We received the free gift. We received the vehicle. Yet you're going to have to tell him, hey, well, I was a good person. And I did this and I don't deserve this. And then he's going to remind you of all the things that you did that you thought you've made up for. Like I've probably forgot stuff already today. I've probably, I've tried not to sin today, but you know what? While I'm in this mortal coil, I've probably sinned at least one occasion today, you know, I can guarantee that for a fact. You know, we don't celebrate sin. We, we, you know, unfortunately, we are sinners by nature. The Bible says man loves darkness rather than, than light. We are naturally diverted in this flesh. Uh, and until we're in a glorified state someday when there's going to be new heavens and earth and what, that, what form that body looks like, where we are going to always sin till then. You know, um, and, and that's that's just simply how it is to answer that point. Yeah, well, I'll answer it in reverse order. 
Um, so because Jesus has overcome the world, I don't have to overcome the world because <laughs> Jesus has paid that sin for me. Yeah, we were we were bought with a price. OK, so quite simply, I'm trusting in what Jesus did and not my own works. So that immediately refutes that instantly. And the, the first part of the question is, let's just say you have a problem with sexual sin which I think most people do, in my personal opinion. Um, we're going to have better days than other days, quite worldly term, but that's quite true. And I think that um, that's why Jesus expressly said we have an advocate with the Father, so that when we recognise and the Holy Spirit that we just grieve reminds us of that, we instantly have an advocate with the father so that we can go straight to god and if i keep my hat left hand there and use this just to answer this if you're a catholic listening to this um or you have rome in there somewhere so this is you here and this is the priest now we have direct communication with god i'm sorry if you don't know this you've never heard this before but the bible says Call no man upon earth father. Okay, so what do Catholics do? They call this guy father, right? Call no man upon earth father. Why? Because we have direct communication as saved, sealed believers with God. We don't need a mediatrix or a mediator through man. That wicked sinner who put very possibly in me being touching young boys or not, I don't know. We don't need to go to him to confess our sins. Okay. We go straight to the Father, and that's how I would answer that. Okay, well, uh, I've got one out there um, <clears throat> uh, for some of my uh, flat earth friends who'll be listening to this. Um, and I'm going to answer this uh, probably in the way you may have not have expected, but it, it, it will suffice. So Jesus says, when you've believed on him, he essentially says this, and he actually uses these key words. He says, I've separated your sins as far as from the east to the west. Now, if we keep going in those direction, they will always, they're never going to come together. They are always going away. Now, for the flat earth crowd, <laughs> this is not flat below here. I'm just joking, of course. I have some wonderful friends who believe in that. Uh, saved guys but you know that's for another day anyway um, but yes so when Jesus so if you don't believe that you're essentially saying that Jesus is lying if he hasn't separated your sins um, because quite simply if one person goes east your sins go east and you go west with Jesus we'll use that example you've drove west in your eternal life Jesus has took your sins like they are not remembered the Bible says no sins. Uh, it says when we get to heaven, all sins are gone. Every tear from every eye shall be wiped away. I'm paraphrasing there, of course. But what I'm trying to get at is maybe people are a little bit unlearned here. Um, and like, look, no matter how much I know, how anybody else knows, I might as well be a complete novice to some people out there. There are lots and lots of people who know the Bible uh, better than I do. And I think that's, uh, even though I've gone through the King James Bible multiple times, no matter who you are, even if you're the person on earth who's read it 300 times, you need to keep learning. Now, here, here's, a, here's, a, here's an example, which you haven't asked this question, but I'm going to add to this, where somebody like a sneaky Calvinist or somebody who thinks with the works of the law would think they would say how, how people take scriptures out of context. They will say something like, well, forever learning and never come to the knowledge of the truth of what I've just said. No, Jesus said we should meditate daily and nightly on the word. So are you calling Jesus a liar? This is why we have to compare scripture with scripture. What Jesus was talking about there was all of these people who go to um, a, fa a false version of Christianity and they're constantly learning or, or even in the world where they believe in... Um, I was literally talking about this the other day. I think it's Fiona Broom who created it at the Dragon Con <laughs> Comic Con event. Uh, what the, the the woman who invented the Mandela effect? 
right? Okay. Um, th- that's just men coming up with devious and cleverly veiled fables. Okay. False religions. Like you either stand on the word of God or you don't. So this is why Jesus takes before any murder or any sin that's ever been committed on earth. This is why he said that anybody who changes my word, and by the way, for anybody who pauses that, I'm not doing the six. I just kind of deviate to that. I gravitate to do that, should I say. Um, anybody who changes my word, I'm going to put you into outer darkness. Now, the Bible doesn't give a full explanation to what that is. But obviously, it's a special punishment for the false prophet. Because if the if Jesus says we have power and death in the tongue, he didn't just say we have power in the tongue to get people saved. He said we have power and death in the tongue, right? Because he knows that most, like he said, many, most are a false prophet. Most are false prophets. Many shall come in my name, most in the modern vernacular, because they all want to have some part and pride of doing it themselves. And that's quite simply the difference between um, somebody who wants to work the way to heaven and climb that Tower of Babel or the person who just simply believes on what Jesus asked them to do by believing on that he was the son of God, that he's going to pay for your sins, past, present, future. You believe in your heart, ideally confess with your mouth. And that's the simple gospel. Because because here's the thing, we're not free from, we'll never be free from sin while we're in this mortal body, okay? And that's the bit they don't understand. Like, if we've been convicted by the Spirit, then, and we've done something wrong, we know as a believer, hey, I shouldn't do that. And do you know what? Any rewards that may have been stored up, they may, may well be taken away. God may lay a call on my head for doing whatever thing I've done wrong. There are punishments involved and there always have been and there always will be till the end of time and time and times, of course. Um, And then obviously we have, we have um, the end of time then obviously, right. And and we're all in heaven in a glorified state, but till then um, we should you know, we should try, you know, you know, the Bible says to be peaceable and amenable with all men. I'll go down this route. You know, like I mentioned something earlier about opening doors to people. I generally tend to open doors sometimes, but do I not um, open doors every time? You better believe I don't. Why? Because I'm late sometimes. Why? I might not like the look of that person. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sinner, remember? I'm a filthy sinner, as described. And um, the people in Nineveh, the people who realized this in Nineveh, we'll use this example, they they tried on their best day to do everything right and, and right every wrong. And God said to them, your works are like filthy rags before my sight. Why did he say that? Well, he said that because we're still in this mortal coil. And this moral coil will always sin, whether that's an evil thought. The, you know, the Bible says even the thought of foolishness is a sin. You know, so if you think of like a dumb joke, that's a sinner. You know, and Peter would say, whoa, God can send you to hell for that. Yes, he can, because you were already born into sin. Now, again, there's a, there's a separate doctrine from a Catholic people out there who, who think the doctrine of original sin stands. I am not responsible for Adam's sin. And he's not responsible for mine. Now, there's one little special thing here. I didn't mention the term Lordship Salvation. And speaking of people catching people out. Now, I detest Lordship Salvation with a passion, just like how obviously God detests it and every other saved person out there when they realize what it is. Obviously, that doesn't apply if you already know what it is, of course. What I want to say is, and possibly I heard, I learned this Um uh, once and I remember a really good preacher who I know called Afshin Yakdin said this um, and he said that in the beginning when there was Adam and Eve Lordship salvation did abound and the reason why was because they didn't need a saviour then that was the original plan of 
earth to be like that. Yeah. And then sin ended the world. So guess what? Because sins ended the world, we now need a savior because we can't save ourselves. Adam and Eve didn't need saving in that context. All right. Well, well, the Bible says, uh, by your fruits, you shall know them. Now, a lot of people and then save people will actually think that's works, but it's not. Uh, sure, there's, a, there's an application you could use towards that. But that, what that's talking about is, is the fruit of the spirit and when we're speaking and stuff. So if we use uh, false prophets and wicked devils like uh, Mr. Joyce May and all of these people, um, you know, they not every one of them may uh, slip up by saying that or whatever. But just in there, what they're actually saying in another way is um, like, and here's an easy one, which probably people can relate to with these types of things, where I would actually agree with some of these people on. And they'll say things like, God gave me a word. And I think, really, did he? Because the last time I checked, the scriptures, as it says, are of no private interpretation. But God gave you a word, did he? Yes, he told me to buy this nice brand new Mercedes and everybody needs to pay me for it. Or Joyce Mayer, I'm sure God told her to buy a $23,000 gold toilet. The Bible says these people are going to be rewarded with their works one day. And there's no, no more serious offense than teaching a false gospel. So we don't immediately need to know every sin of these people, but yet they'll testify of them that their own will themselves. Because if you think it's the reverse of Jesus, Jesus said, I've not came of my own will, but of that of him who sent me in the form of a servant. So when we go out, we never take money for the gospel. Now, I'm not saying, as the Bible says, we can't have money for, say, uh, travel and food, obviously, but to store money up and store treasures up, not to big myself up, but you've been there uh, when we were preaching in Manchester once, and people could have quite literally shoving money in my hand, and I refused to take it, because, like, the wages of sin is death. Like, and yes, I'm a saved believer, but the, the seriousness and her, God might have took me out on the spot for taking that. We, we can't take that. Now, the reason why God allows these people into the world is maybe someday people can contrast the, the fruits of the spirit with what they're saying eventually to say, hey, you know, God's word's quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged soul and pierce the very asunder. So that when God's word's really speaking to somebody, and they compare that with to what these false devils are actually saying, they're going to know, hey, this is all just a show. And when I grew up with these people, it's all about emotionalism. You know, it's all about the show, you know. And the thing is, we're dealing with God's word. We're, we're not dealing with, like, some local celebrity or whatever it is. But these people want to put themselves on a pedestal, you know. Yeah, I mean, the bringing forth works bit uh, nicely ties in with something like, say, James 2, where we need to understand the context of that book, just like every false Jehovah's Witness will say, see, you need to have works, show me thy works. Yeah, the only problem is with that, though, you need to be saved to understand that because an unsaved person can't understand the Bible because you're bearing that witness now in the spirit of telling me. The context of James 2 is wrote for people who are actually saved and for, say, like, disciples and, and people senior in the church or whatever it is. Because, really, if you know the Bible that well and you need to know, you should be going soul winning and you should be doing it. Okay, you need to get your lazy carcass out there and be doing it, right? So that's an easy one for that one. Uh, and in terms of, um, I think you said about, I've come to uh, not come for the righteous. Um, it's around where, you know, Jesus come to, to sit with the sinners and the publicans and harlots, right? Well, there's a reason why he did that because then they clearly need the gospel most. It's like to give you this analogy or this 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 explanation would be like you're more likely to get saved people in the poorer neighborhood than a rich one because that's why again Jesus evidenced this that for us it's easier for a man to get saved and I'm butchering this, of course. I also forget this. But for a man to go through the eye of a, need a camel to go through the eye of a needle than somebody to get saved, essentially. Because what he's saying there is people who've stored up their wealth, 
they, what do they need Jesus for? You know, and even people who aren't wealthy, let's think of the false prophets who want to just show off or, or whatever reason they're preaching a the false gospel or are clearly, as the Bible says, which is the most worrying, actively working for Satan. Um, you know, what do you need Jesus for? Because obviously you're working your own uh, your own way there and eventually they are going to all roads lead back to Matthew seven twenty one. you know? Um, so that would be my answer to that. Well, yeah, I mean, the thing is, Jesus Jesus uh, quite clearly explains in the gospel that sins have been paid for past, present and future. I mean, we as human beings can't fully understand that. A bit like, how would you say, like the Trinity? Like, say, for example, a Muslim would say, well, the, the, the word uh, Trinity is not in the Bible. And I'd say, OK, well, the word paedophile is not in there. OK, two can play at that game. But obviously, clearly, um, the, 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 you know, the, the context is there. You know, Muhammad desired a six-year-old girl and my reader at nine. Okay. Um, clearly, the Bible says in terms of the Trinity staying on point, it says, uh, for there are three that bear record in heaven and these three are one. Now, we can't fully understand that. And we'll talk about this another time about the sin, the, the heresy of, um, uh, well, the oneness heresy um, or, or the technical term is modalism. You know, it's, you know, a lot of Hindus say this in a redirected way and stuff. God is one, if you've heard that. No, God is not one. Those of us who are saved serve a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. <laughs> uh, and these three are one. So, yeah, so that would be my answer to that. And again, and this is why this is why God is not to be mocked and God will just cut down any false nonsense because I would immediately say again, well, have you turned from all your secret sins? Can you tell me what all your secret sins are? You know, the ones you don't even know about that you have fault in. And they're not going to be able to answer that. Yeah, exactly. And again, um, that answers itself, though, in the sense of that's why a false sneaky prophet will go see known sin. No, no, sin's still sin. It's still defined as a transgression of the law, whether it's known or unknown. You just want to word it that way, just like how piety, how Ray Discomfort will speak out of both sides of his mouth. Well, I, I, and I get that sneaky point to try to make. However, because we're on a limited time period here, um Satan's naturally gonna trick us into believing something that's false. Um and because we've listened to that voice of Satan, um and we've listened to say a ray discomfort, you know, that's why there's no greater punishment because that person has gone, Well, I've tried my very best. I've tried my very best to turn from all of these sins. But yet we've already given the answer. God has already said, there's not a just man upon earth that does good and sins not. So unless you are a God yourself, or for any Mormons listening, then I guess you can turn from your own sins. You know, so there's no way around it. Um, and these people need to get right with God. I, I personally don't think... And I think the Bible evidence this in itself that the Bible even tells us that some false prophets can be saved. Right. However, God only knows the line between the spiritual reprobate doctrine, how how much rope he's prepared to give people, you know, because not everybody's obviously going to write their own religion or write their own book or whatever. However, invariably, <laughs> so should you say most people who have say, and we'll, we'll use an easy one, the Jehovah's False Witnesses. A lot of those people, not all, uh, Satan's biggest evangelists, um, a lot of those people have actually grew up in that. And the human side of me says, well, I quite feel sorry for them. But more importantly, rather than what I think, what God says is he's not a respecter of persons. 
So when you do give the gospel, and by the way, yes, we should we should rebuke sometimes and use our discernment. But, you know, sometimes we should give the gospel to them. And when we give that gospel to them and if they hear that word, then the blood, as it says, is off our hands because they've heard the right word now. So it's up to them to hear that because a lot of those people have made a God in their own image. So again, it goes back to that thing. They don't need a savior. They don't need the blood of Jesus. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses, I don't know whether people know this. They believe in a term called annihilationism. And by the way, if anybody who knows who listens to uh, Rennie Rowland, by the way, she also believes in that. So another unsaved heretic who's on the way to hell. Um, so essentially what the what annihilation teaches is that when we die, uh, hell in the Bible is just this literal made up place or Sheol or Hades is the fancy term, the underworld. No, God says the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. That's a literal torment in the lake of fire that you're going to get. Okay. Somehow the false prophet has an even worse punishment than that. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, we, when we're explained, even to somebody who's of, of, of a false religion, we still present the gospel the same way. Now then, there may be slightly different angles of the way we phrase the question or, or most definitely follow-up questions. However, the gospel will always be the same no matter who you are. You're a fleshly man. You deserve hell. Sentence has already been passed. And the only way out of that is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. That's it. 